What's up, guys? Welcome to Voicey here. This is your still sweaty host, God damn it, Texas, Captain Zach. And today's subreddit is a new one that I hope you guys will enjoy. R slash Tales About Kevin. No, 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 no. Stories about Kevin. Don't go to Tales About Kevin. Big mistake. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. This story's called My Friend Tries to Divorce Kevin. When we were all younger and dumber, one of my closest friends married the craziest Kevin I've ever met. My friend had just come off of a very bad relationship that she'd been certain was going to end in marriage, when in reality, the guy was cheating on her while using her to support his wannabe pro golfer existence, then dumped her when someone with more money came along. So, she was in a bad place. A few months later, Kevin appears. The first time I met Kevin was when the two of them showed up at my apartment to announce their engagement. Since I'd met the previous guy that she was seriously dating just a month before, I know they couldn't have been seeing each other very long. Turns out, Kevin proposed five weeks after their first date. Maybe she was a bit of a Kevin too for saying yes at that point, but like I said, bad place. It's hard for me to accurately describe Kevin without dipping into being mean, because I never liked him from that first meeting. It was like he really wanted to be one of those hyper-masculine manly men, but didn't quite know how. He liked to take any opportunity to bring up in conversation that he was a black belt. I remember the first time he said it because I asked, Oh, yeah? And what? And he looked at me like I was an idiot. In martial arts? Oh, right, <laughs> of course. He also would talk, at length, about how much he worked out. Turns out he didn't actually work out at all. He liked to think of himself as a car guy, because he had a sports car he couldn't afford and treated it like his baby. He didn't actually know anything about cars, but he had one. So, car guy. But the thing that really got up my nose about the guy was that he prided himself on how very smart he was. He'd make the most outrageous claims with the most pigeon-headed certainty. He just knew these things were true, and if he disagreed, even if he showed actual, physical proof that he was wrong, he'd just condescendingly tell you that you didn't understand these things like he did and just go on with his idiocy. Just as an example, he once declared that you can't break a law at night. What exactly does that mean? We still don't know. He wouldn't elaborate. As a second example, he had trouble getting a fire going in their fireplace when he was home alone one day. His solution? Mix up some homemade napalm from a recipe he found on the internet. It was a huge disaster, set the kitchen on fire. Luckily, my friend arrived home in time to grab the fire extinguisher. Yet, he insisted doggedly that he knew what he was doing. And really, this was the best way to get the fireplace going. And obviously, she just didn't understand because she didn't know as much about this stuff as he did. Sorry, I know, that's a lot of setting the stage. One last important thing to know about Kevin before we get round to the divorce I promised, Kevin was a religious nut. I don't mean he was crazy because he was religious. I've known many wonderful, intelligent, religious people in my lifetime. Kevin was a crazy person who used religion as his M.O. He would randomly proclaim, the Bible says, to support whatever other crazy thing he'd said. Most people let him get away with it because, hell, the Bible is really long and says a lot of crazy crap. Who could say that somewhere in there, it didn't actually say whatever insane thing he was claiming? And besides, who wants to confront crazy? Even when the claim was something insane like, the Bible says that birds are the devil. Yes, this is a thing he said one day when he was angry at birds for some reason. I was raised going to church twice a week, once upon a time. So I knew a bit about that particular book, and I had a pathological need when I was younger to call people on their BS. So we often butted heads. Unsurprisingly, when confronted, Kevin could never actually tell you where in the Bible it said you shouldn't take the first slice of pizza. Yep, he said that too, but it didn't decrease his certainty that it was in there. So as anyone but the two of them could have predicted, the marriage didn't last. He became increasingly erratic, forbidding her from speaking to friends, including me, because the Bible says so, hitting her, 
because the Bible says she has to do whatever he says and that he's allowed to beat her if she doesn't, stuff like that. So she left and here is where the wackiest Kevining begins. She gets a lawyer to initiate divorce proceedings and the first thing that comes up is the house. They bought the house from his parents. More precisely, she bought the house from his parents. He had terrible credit. As a result, his name wasn't on anything related to the house. He also had no job, meaning he would never made a single payment on the house. As far as she saw it, the house was hers. His mother, who came into town to support her son through his misfortune, didn't see it that way. They declared that the house still belonged to the mother and threw all of my friend's stuff out on the lawn. Friend's lawyer gets a preliminary hearing date set up to determine the initial dispersion of important stuff like the house, at least until the divorce proceedings get all sorted. So, Friend's lawyer says to Kevin, have your lawyer contact me to set up a meeting before the hearing. A meeting is set up and who arrives at the lawyer office but Kevin, dressed in jeans and a windbreaker, claiming to be Mr. Steele, the lawyer. I crap you not. He decided he'd be his own lawyer and call himself Mr. Steele, not his name. I don't know how the initial meeting went, but when the time came for the hearing, Kevin was once again acting as his own attorney. This time I can only assume he wasn't working under a pseudonym. Keep in mind, the rest of this is totally going off of her story to me immediately after the hearing. Kevin and his mother arrive 20 minutes late, not at all dressed for court, casual jeans and shirts. The first thing he says when he walks in is, Can I approach the bench? Why? The judge asks. Because I have some receipts? So, friend gets called to the stand. Her lawyer asks a bunch of questions illustrating just how crazy Kevin is and how bad things had gotten about the house and stuff. Then Kevin, since he's the lawyer, gets to cross-examine. His first question is, Is it not true that you were beaten as a child? Objection, the judge says. Sustained. The question had nothing to do with anything. Other questions included, Is it not true that you were seeing a psychiatrist and on medication for depression? No, it's not true. She'd never seen a mental health professional. Not sure if he thought he might trick her into lying on that one or if he was so crazy that he actually thought it was true. He asked a bunch of other ridiculous questions, which led her lawyer to let him ask because they were completely out of nowhere and just helped prove to the judge how nuts he was. Then he takes the stand. Her lawyer gets him to admit to pretty much everything they said he did, because it was all true, but he refuses to give specific answers to some of the more serious questions. Not no, just doesn't want to give specifics. Then he gets to make a statement. His statement is how he doesn't want a divorce and also she was abusive to him, such as pinching him once when they were on the highway. Also, the Bible says that she's his wife, so she has to do whatever he wants, and that divorce is bad. How can the judge make them get a divorce when the Bible says not to? Apparently, he went on in this vein for a while. She just gave a couple of the highlights. Needless to say, the initial hearing did not go his way. She ended up getting the house in the short term and a protective order against him after he admitted in court to his violence against her. The Bible says it's okay though. After this, he dragged his feet at every point of the process. For more than six months, he wouldn't show up to things or would refuse to sign things until the last possible moment. He moved to a different city and apparently joined the Army Reserve. When Friend found out about this, her lawyer contacted someone there to point out that he wasn't allowed to be around weapons or something like that because of the protective order. Legal stuff that's over my head. The lawyer even contacted him and offered to drop the protective order so he could stay in if he just agreed to finish the divorce proceedings in a timely manner. Kevin refused. In the end, he got pretty much nothing and quietly disappeared. Wow, I have no <laughs> words. Um, sh Guys, let loose in the comments. I know you have plenty to say about him. <laughs> This story's called Stuck on an Island with a Kavina. Some time ago, I was in an organization teaching English abroad. When we were told which parts of the country we'd be sent off to, I was chosen to be with the Kavina of the group on a tiny island in the middle of nowhere. Crap. Here are some short stories about working with a Kavina. Apologies for the length, some of them require a bit of context to help you understand her shenanigans. 
Part 1. Training, or lack thereof. Kavina can't pay attention. She's a space cadet and can't focus on anything for more than a few minutes. When you call her name, she says, Huh? If you're telling a story among friends, a conversation she is a part of, and you mention her name in the story, she says, Huh? More than a few times, I'd been telling her something and watched her face go blank as she tuned out from the world. During training, we read some pamphlets and worksheets as a group. We would do popcorn reading, where one person reads a paragraph or two, and then selects who will read next. When I read passages, I would always choose Kavina to read next. Huh? And each time, she was in a daze and on the wrong page. I got called out by others for being mean, but if you're being funded to do work abroad, thanks to your tax dollars, you should probably not have your head up your ass. Just a thought. Kavina can't stay awake. Every Monday through Friday, we had teacher training in the morning and language classes in the afternoon. During our language class, we'd get a five-minute break and Kavina would be asleep on the dirty cement floor when we got back, officially useless the rest of the day. This was routine. When asked why she was so tired all the time, she said she woke up every morning to work out on the road outside her house from 3 a.m. until sunrise. Along a span of 30 feet back and forth, she'd do some jogging, sidesteps, and high knees. Basically a sports warm-up. How you make a three-hour workout out of that is beyond me. To no one's surprise, she wasn't very good at speaking the language. Kavina is cultured. During training, we stayed with a local host family for three months. This was before we would be assigned to our permanent site for the next two years to do our job. Toward the end of training, we had one session about how immersed we felt in our community and rated ourselves one through five how we felt. A one meant you knew little about the culture or language and don't feel part of it at all, and a five meant you felt so integrated that you're basically another local. We all felt quite detached from the community because we were leaving in a week and we had been studying a new language. Most rated themselves a two, and a few said one. Kavina rated herself a five. Part two, at sight. Kavina goes stargazing. If you haven't seen a night sky in the remotest of remote locations, you really should. You can see the stars so clearly that you can see them twinkling red and blue. I pointed out a twinkling star to Kavina one night, and she disagreed and insisted it was an airplane. When I pointed out more of them and that the first star had not moved after a while, she then said they're stationary satellites. Not satellites that orbit at the same rate as the Earth's rotation, but satellites that just… Uh, sit there. Kavina understands local customs. The culture we lived in has a core belief in sharing everything. Everyone asks each other for things and is expected to share. It's frowned upon to be stingy, but wise folk know not to flaunt their valued possessions or else people will ask you for them and run you dry. A hot commodity is tobacco. Sometimes for smoking, but usually for mixing with betel nuts, a local drug. Cigarettes cost about $5 a pack, and the average wage is about $1.50 per hour. When Kavina started smoking, she walked around the village with cigarettes tucked into her dreadlocks, one behind each ear, and smoking one at the same time. She complained about people always asking to bum cigarettes. Kavina forgets protocol. Our organization was very strict on water safety. We had strict training about safety because deaths at sea is the number one cause of death in the organization, so don't screw it up. If we're caught not following the rules, we're instantly fired. We each were issued a satellite phone, life jacket, and locator beacon that sends an SOS signal if stranded at sea, and had to have them at all times when on the boat. We each signed our name to assume responsibility for them. One day, we went on a trip to another island. I was at the beach about to call my boss to report I was going out when I realized I didn't have my locator beacon with me. Kavina approaches, so I asked if by chance she had packed her locator beacon. She didn't understand. You know, the neon yellow thing that sends a distress signal if we're stranded? Nope, never heard of it. I begrudgingly went home to retrieve mine and showed it to her. She claims she's never seen it before in her life, and admin must have dropped the ball by never giving her one. We had about one month left in our two-year assignment then. Kavina does group therapy. 
a really bad typhoon hit our island, unfortunately. Myself, Kavina, and a few others were evacuated to the mainland days before it had arrived. It was refreshing to be on the mainland, and we enjoyed burgers, beers, and comfort. Until we saw the storm picked up to 160 miles per hour, and was headed straight for our islands with poor infrastructure and limited resources. We were hit with guilt for living in luxury while our community's lives were in danger. The day before the storm hit was a stressful time and we were feeling very sad and scared. So we had a group session to talk and be there for one another. To start it off, we talked about ground rules like respect others' opinions, don't interrupt, and so on. During this, Kavina does a Dwight Schrute and blurts out, Question! What if you don't feel anything? Catastrophic events affect people in different ways, and I think she just didn't know how to process the way she was feeling, but her poor choice of words was not well received by the group and stirred up some drama. Kavina gets an apartment. Kavina stayed in an apartment on the mainland for a short time. Around when she was leaving, I got a bad infection in my toe that spread, so I had to be flown to the mainland hospital. I needed a temporary place to stay, so I just took over the apartment. She uh, moved out before I showed up, but it looked like she had just went out for the day and decided not to come back. She left the air conditioner on for over a week. Over there, they burned diesel fuel to power their generators. Terrible, I know and electricity costs $6 per kilowatt. I'll let r slash they did the math calculate the cost of that mistake. The apartment reeked of cigarettes, though the apartments were non-smoking, and there are really nice front and back balconies. She denies having smoked in the apartment. Maybe she was being honest, and the lone culprit for the smell was the extra-large glass salad bowl filled nearly to the brim with cigarette butts on the kitchen counter. She not only left cigarette butts, she left behind dirty sheets on the bed, a few random clothes, some random items, and an Amazon package containing an expensive portable speaker. I saw the invoice inside, and the cost of shipping was almost as much as the speaker itself. In my own Kevin moment, I left the back balcony door unlocked, and somebody stole it. Kavina never remembered it, and I kept my mouth shut. I wanted pasta my first night. Dirty dishes were left in the sink, and there was no sponge in sight. Until I saw from my angle a sponge sitting atop the bathroom sink. Considering it to be my lucky day, I grabbed the sponge and ran it underwater in the kitchen sink. Only to realize both my hands and the dishes were covered in tiny prickly hairs. She left her body hair shaving scrub for me to discover, and they were not easy to remove. I think I'll end it here, as this post is already quite long. I have other stories, including one where Kavina tries to start beef with me if you're interested. Wow, Kavina is one ditzy individual. But yeah, that sounds insanely frustrating. Uh, <laughs> there's an expectation of professionality when you join organizations like that, and um, she obviously did not meet those requirements. So, seeing it in the perspective of someone who does meet those um, expectations, those standards, uh, someone who is just skating by, by the skin of their teeth, by being, like, uh, ditzy and just irresponsible in general. I can see that being really, uh, really frustrating. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.